I've really enjoyed that time of drawing close to God, haven't you? We're reading from Acts chapter 19, Paul's return visit to Ephesus. I'm reading from verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. A new teacher to a school, starting in September in one of his classes, thought he'd just find out where they were as far as their spiritual understanding was concerned. Some of you will know this story. It's a well-known one. And so he asked them a question as he began his lesson. He said, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? to be faced with a lot of blank faces. He thought he'd ask again, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? Again, no response whatsoever. So he tried a third time. Who knocked down the walls of Jericho? Whereby a boy at the back nervously put his hand up and said, please, sir, it wasn't me. Later during that morning break, as the teachers got together in the staff room, one of the other teachers, a, a more... Uh, regular teacher at the school said to his colleague and how did it go this morning how did you get on and he said well I must confess I was a little bit disappointed I um I started my lesson by asking who knocked down the walls of Jericho and first of all I couldn't get any response out of them and eventually one boy at the back said it wasn't him can you believe that and uh, and the other teacher said what did the boy look like and he, he said well he was tall with dark hair and glasses Oh, I know that boy, he said, and if you said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. And later in the day, of course, the head teacher wanted to just see how his new teacher got on. So the head teacher drew him in and said, now, how's the first day been? How's it gone for you? And so he told the story again. I asked the, I asked the class who knocked down the walls of Jericho. And this boy, I think his name is Brown, said it wasn't him. Can you believe that head, headmaster? And then in the staff room, I was talking to one of the other staff members. And he said he knew the boy and he always spoke the truth. I mean, if he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. Can you believe that, headmaster? And the headmaster said, well, look, look let's just get the wall built and we'll just send the county hall the, the uh, bill. Sort of three punchlines in one, that one, isn't it, really? But we all need to keep growing in our understanding. Whatever else this little passage shows us, it shows us that as we engage with the infinite God, there's never a point at which we can say, got it, done it, have it all. Because by definition, we who are finite beings always need to know more. So Paul has returned to Ephesus. He said if, if he had time, if the Lord wanted, he will come back. Well, he's come back. And as he comes back, he sees some disciples. It's a bit ambiguous, that, because it is the standard word that Luke uses for Christians so some commentators say, well, they couldn't have been Christians because they didn't have the filling of the Spirit. But it's a standard word. And it's, always, it's almost always used by Luke, both in his Gospel and in the book of Acts, to mean a follower of Jesus. Sometimes he uses it to mean a follower of John the Baptist. So it could be here. But he usually says a follower of John or a follower of the Pharisees. 
So he asks, he sees something, Paul sees something about them that's missing. He recognizes that. We don't get the whole conversation, obviously. But he notices enough to think there's something missing here. So he asks them a direct question, because he's, he's nothing if not blunt, is Paul, isn't he? So he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they go, Holy Spirit? What Holy Spirit? So, he, so then he pursues it a little more and says, what kind of baptism did you receive? And he discovers that they received John's baptism. Well, the difference between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism is that John's was a preparatory baptism. He was the one who'd been sent ahead, in the words of Isaiah, to prepare the way for the Lord. So his task was to challenge people. You could almost say threaten people, but I think that's too strong a word. Challenge people to say, someone's coming and you need to be ready, so you need to take action. Repent, for there's one coming whose sandals I'm not fit to untie. His task was to prepare for the Messiah. He called people to be ready for Jesus. And as he points towards Jesus, he differentiates between his ministry and Jesus' ministry in this way. Each time he mentions it, he says, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The thongs of whose, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John baptized with water for repentance. Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. And from the outset of his ministry, right at the beginning, Jesus says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. So John's baptism is a kind of, you must change. You must get ready. You must turn around and get ready. So it's a kind of preparing, preparation. But Jesus is an invitation. Repent and believe the good news. And then you can come and join me and enter into the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom had long been promised by God. Daniel spoke about it in chapter 2. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It will itself endure forever. Ezekiel had prophesied it. We read God saying there in chapter 36, I will give you, he says to his people, a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. And of course, we all know the one from Joel 2, where Joel declares God saying, I will pour out my spirit on all people. In Joel's day, certain people for certain tasks were given the spirit, but not all people. But God is promising in Joel's day that one day everyone would receive God's spirit. Even on my servants, specifically, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit. And after he was raised from the dead, Jesus in Acts chapter 1 promised his followers that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And we know Pentecost was a day when those Old Testament promises and that promise from Jesus came true. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit and now they could be sent off on the task they should do. So Paul, being a good pastor, not only tells his people what they should know, but then wants them to experience what they should experience. It's not for him just to tell them about it and leave them. He wants them to enter into it. So he baptizes them into the name of Jesus in water. And then he lays his hands on them that they may receive the Holy Spirit. And they do. And tongues and prophecy follow. What joy. Now Luke is leading us into a time when he's going to talk about Paul's visit to Ephesus, which is exciting and challenging. The next few verses of this chapter are going to tell us about miraculous healings, powerful exorcisms, deliverances, strong opposition, and even a frightening riot. 
And this is an example of the spiritual warfare that Paul will add to his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 6. He would later describe it to the Corinthians as if he was fighting wild beasts. This is really going to be a difficult time. And so Luke is preparing us that we can't face the world alone. We need help. We need all the help that God can give. The giving of the Holy Spirit is not for some small elite group of Christians. It's not for the super spiritual people. It's not so we can boast to other people. It's to allow us to be the witnesses of Jesus before a world that will mock us, oppose us, and challenge us with all kinds of difficult situations. And it's in the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 5 that Paul will encourage all the believers to go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the reason for that, of course, is that we, in one famous evangelist's words, we leak. The image he has is of a of a sponge in the water. If you put a sponge in water and put it fully in the water, the water is in the sponge and the sponge is in the water fully. But to the extent you draw the sponge out of the water, to that extent the water goes out of the sponge. For that reason, Paul says, go on, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit because you leak. Now we could at this point talk about the fruit of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit, very tempting, but I want to run another little route. Because I believe that for many people, many Christians, some at least of our problems arise from two wrong views. A wrong view of who God is and a wrong view of who we are. Well, a wrong view of God is a subject all for itself. But let's just talk briefly about a wrong view of who we are. When Jesus was baptized in water by John the Baptist, he was taken by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And underlying the three challenges the devil brings is this one, a challenge that he was the son of God, if you are the son of God. Now, the father had just declared at his baptism, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And immediately that issue of identity is challenged by the devil. In my limited experience, some of the followers of Jesus, sensitive to their own weaknesses and failures, find themselves from time to time at least struggling on this issue. Am I really a child of God? Especially when we feel at our lowest because of illness, sickness, or the pressures coming on us, or just that general feeling of getting it all wrong. Well, Paul would write to the Romans in chapter 8, this verse. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. God gives us his spirit. God fills us with his spirit in order that we may know for sure we are the children of God, not because we get everything right, not even because it feels good, but because it is a fact that God has made us by his grace, his children. And we need to know that, not arrogantly, but humbly, that we will not be diverted from our task. If the devil can undermine that, keep pulling the rug from under our feet, we'll end up on our backs, all the time, struggling to cope. But if we know for sure, through the Spirit of God, that we are his sons, he gives us a place to stand. The Spirit comes, my friends, to reassure you, however you are feeling at this moment, that you really are God's child. And nothing can change that. All of us, secondly, from time to time, struggle with sin. Again, the more sensitive you are to the Spirit, then the more you're going to struggle with this issue because you'll realize the weaknesses and frailties that you struggle with. Again, in the same book and in the same chapter, Paul writes this to his friends in Rome. 
He wants them to know what is theirs and to live in the good of it. And he writes this. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you by the spirit, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And he goes on to add, and this spirit helps us in our weakness. The spirit himself intercedes for us, for the saints, in accordance with God's will. So this life that God has given us, this life we have received because we are the children of God, we're not meant to live on our own. Indeed, it is impossible. But the Spirit has been given to help us live this life. He prays on our behalf and he strengthens us in our struggles against sin. We're not going to be perfect. And John, in his letters to the church, will remind us what we should do when that sort of things happen. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and so on. But here Paul is reassuring us that we're not on our own. Whatever you're struggling with at the moment, you're not on your own. The Spirit, indeed the Son as well, but the Spirit is interceding with the Father on your behalf. And the Spirit wants to give you power in your body, he wants to strengthen you so you can stand against the enemy. Furthermore, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we always want, we always want to speak and act with a heart full of love. Paul wrote this. Again, the same letter, Romans, a different chapter this time, chapter 5. But he wrote this. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us isn't that a wonderful thought the limitless love of God has been poured out into our limited hearts by his Holy Spirit and out of the fullness of the love that the Spirit pours into our hearts, we can speak words of love and do small acts of kindness with great love. So what we want to be that the core of all that we say and do is a gift to us from God. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and indeed poured his love into us that we might overflow with the love of God. This is what Paul wants for these people. The spiritual fruit will come. The gifts will come. Indeed, they come straight away. And Paul will have opportunity both to demonstrate their usefulness and to help them into them. But most of all, he needs to, they need to know who they are and who has given them the help they need just to live. Of course, as disciples, our greatest desire our most earnest longing, our deepest yearning is to be like Jesus. Paul writes to the Corinthians in his second lesson, letter, verse chapter 3. He says this, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. More than anything else, the Spirit in us begins to transform us into the image of the one we love so much. This is an inner working. He wants to transform us from within. This is not just about compliant behavior, but that goes a long way. Obedience means we are compliant to God's way. 
But the transformation comes from within. A new heart, a new spirit, transforming us each day to become more like Jesus. So, filled with the Spirit of God and reassured that we truly are the precious children of God, confident that we are not alone in our struggle with sin, but God's Spirit helps us overcome sin. And with our hearts overflowing with the love of God, becoming more daily like Jesus, we have the power to be the witnesses of Jesus to a needy world. Jesus said to those disciples in chapter 1 of Acts, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And every disciple wants to be that, a witness to Jesus. And the gift of the Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit, is to enable us to know who we are and to know who God is, that we may bear witness to him. That's what the Spirit's been given. And so Paul immediately leads them to the place where they can receive that Holy Spirit. Now, we mustn't move from where we are. But we don't need to come together in a little huddle. We don't need to lay our hands on one another because God is here for all of us. So I'm going to pray in a second. And it can be a prayer that you can follow and enter if you, if you want to. It's my conviction that it doesn't matter how often or how much God has filled you in the past, at this moment in time, there's always a new opportunity, a fresh opportunity for God to fill you with his spirit. Indeed, in the book of Acts, we have the disciples being baptized in the spirit in chapter 2 and then filled again in chapter 4. That seems to be the pattern. So you may like to adopt a, a, a stance where you can enter into what God has for you. The words may be mine. You can borrow them in your mind if you want to, or you can pray your own prayer. But God is here now, and his desire is to give us his Holy Spirit. When Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he gave them the Lord's Prayer and then concluded his examples of God's goodness by saying this, won't God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And the answer is a resounding, yes, he will. So as you sit where you are sitting, whether here in the chapel or at home, just enter into a place where you can receive from God. And this is how I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we honour your holy name. We pray that your kingdom will come here on earth and in our lives. And we thank you for caring for our needs, for your forgiveness of our sins, as we forgive others who have sinned against us freely and without limit. Lord Jesus, we confess with our mouths that you are Lord and we believe in our hearts that God has raised you from the dead. You invited us to ask and it would be given to us, to seek and we would find, to knock and the door would be opened to us. Thank you for giving us confidence to approach the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we are knocking on heaven's door, which we know is open to us because of the perfect sacrifice of your Son. We are seeking your favour, which we know we have because we come in the name of your Son. And we have a request to make of you, which we know we will receive, for you are the God who gives all good and perfect gifts come from you, and you willingly give your Holy Spirit to those who ask you. Father, this is our request. Please, in your mercy and grace, fill every one of us 
with your wonderful and glorious Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, glorious Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth and love and joy, we welcome you. Will you pour out your love, joy and peace into our hearts, filling our mouths with your praise, our minds with your truth and our bodies with your strength. May we never grieve you quench you, nor disobey you, but always delight to walk in step with you all the days of our lives. Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we adore you. We lay our lives before you and tell you how much we love you. Thank you for giving us yourself. May every part of our lives be filled with praise, that our whole being may speak of you and your love. To you be praise and honour and glory and power, now and forevermore. Amen.